Man, is it a good time to be a Marathon fan? We've got a whole ass, brand new Marathon game in development for the first time in 27 years. The first game since 1995 to be developed by Bungie themselves. Uh, however, a number of gamers have expressed criticism at the fact that the new game is gonna be a PvP extraction shooter rather than a new single player campaign with some multiplayer thrown in as well. And while Bungie hasn't exactly been winning people over with this announcement, or in general, it's still incredibly hype that Bungie is going in this direction at all, but with their continued development on Destiny 2, so, so here's hoping they can pull it together and give us a decent game. Meanwhile, for me, I'm so glad I finally made it to this point in the history series. The first marathon was such a wonderful surprise that I nearly played Marathon 2 as soon as I was done with that one, but I'm glad I waited. With everything else in the news, I couldn't be more hyped for this right now. It's time to boot it up! Oh hey future me, w uh, what are you doing here? Is the timeline need some fixing? Don't worry about it kid, I've been waiting for this moment to come around so I could uh, just witness it. Oh no shit, my first time playing Marathon 2? <laughs> Damn, this must be important, let's go! <laughs> What? What what is this? What did they do to it? What what did they do to Marathon? Shh, it's okay. It's okay. I'm I'm here for you. That's why I'm here. Moral support. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how did this happen? 1995 was a huge year for Bungie. To start off with, they attended the San Francisco Macworld Expo in January, uh, a little under a month after the release of their brand new shooter, Marathon. Marathon was seeing huge sales, absolutely living up to the hype and splendor that had been built up prior to the release, and then some. So Bungie's showing at Macworld 95 was something of a comeback for them. See. The last time they'd been in San Francisco, Marathon's demo had met with tepid reviews and remarks and dismissal, since at the time it didn't look too much different from their previous shooter, Pathways into Darkness. I, I understand that Pathways into Darkness is less of a full-fledged shooter and probably better defined as a dungeon crawler with guns, but this is not split hairs right now. As far as the evolution of the Marathon series is concerned, Pathways leads into Marathon, and Marathon leads into Marathon 2. But, but back to Macworld. Bungie was just living their best lives at this show, just reveling in their successful new game, having a blast conducting a multiplayer deathmatch tournament, which saw the winner walking away with a brand new Power Macintosh as a prize, and they even sold out of copies of Marathon fairly early into the show itself. Things just couldn't be better for Bungie in this moment. They literally had to hire someone to handle phone calls and emails from the press in regards to both Marathon and whatever they were about to start working on next. Something that staff at Bungie were surprisingly quiet about. You'd think that after seeing such soaring success that the team would be frothing at the mouth to continue to hype excitement for their next project, but their lips were sealed for months. There was, however, one tiny little remark made by Jason Jones as part of an interview that appeared in the back of the Marathon Strategy Guide by Tunser Denise. Marathon's ending really does leave a lot of room for something else to happen. I don't know how many people noticed this, but the very last thing that happens to the player in Marathon is that he is teleported off the last level to... where? Maybe someday we'll take advantage of this. Meanwhile, fans were anticipating an expansion that had been advertised on a flyer in the Marathon Big Box, which was to be titled the Marathon 2010 Scenario Pack. The gist of this was that it was going to be a collection of 10 new solo levels and 20 network levels, and there was even a suggestion of a network upgrade and a brand new weapon to be included alongside it. Well, March came and went with no word or update on the 2010 pack, and there was a good reason for it. Bungie was hard at work on Marathon 2 instead. Announced on July 19th, 1995, this was 
a tremendous shock to fans of the first game, partly because they had been anticipating the scenario pack for some time, and partly because Jason Jones had been vocal about his distaste for sequels because, quote, many only exist to milk an obvious cash cow, unquote. Oh, really? To their credit, though, Bungie had initially intended to finish the 2010 scenario pack alongside work on Marathon 2, but as they got deeper in the weeds, they realized that Marathon 2 would no doubt suffer if they tried to co-develop both titles. So unfortunately for fans, the scenario pack was what got the axe. However, a couple of maps built for the pack ended up making their way into Marathon 2 with a little shuffling and redesigning to fit into the campaign. So one thing going into this that I want you kids to understand is that the Bungie crew all had some individual gripes with some of the design elements of the first game. Jason Jones notoriously has denounced the famously terrible marathon level, Colony Ship for Sale Cheap, a map that he himself designed for the first game, and he stated multiple times that he wanted to atone for the sins of that map. And there were quite a few members of the development team who'd been frustrated about different bits and bobs that they felt that they could have done better, or even done smoother. Hence, when Bungie put out their press release announcing Marathon 2, they pulled no punches in making it clear that they were elevating the experience and the design of the first game for the second go-around. The Marathon 2 engine was a leap and a hop above the first game's engine, and Bungie was raring to show gamers what it could do. Marathon 2's engine includes a new widescreen graphics format, with support for deeper color depths and higher resolutions, including a new player interface. Now, nearly all of the textures and sounds from the previous game were replaced, and the game featured new dynamic lighting and color usage throughout the levels. Bungie also included a new active panning enhanced stereo sound for the heavy use of ambient noises, which Bungie utilized to its fullest extent as they completely removed the use of background music during levels. So no ominous, etheric synth soundtrack playing as you stalk the levels during this one. Yeah, I, um... I'll, I'll talk about that one when the time comes. The game also features new weapons and enemies, outdoor environments, and even underwater exploration. It's the underwater aspect of the game engine that is truly fascinating and really deserves some mad respect simply for the fact that Bungie was not only able to get this shit working in their engine, but for just how much variety there was to the liquid physics in-game. And also for the fact that this appears to be the first FPS game to feature full, vertical, underwater movement as a part of gameplay. In our examination of the history of first-person shooters up to this point, I have yet to come across a game that allowed for this kind of extensive underwater exploration. It used to be that if you fell in, you fell in and you were fucked. Although Tech War did feature some areas where you could go underwater, even if there wasn't the same kind of verticality or actual swimming physics that Marathon 2 has. Wait, was, was Tech War the first FPS game to feature underwater exploration? What the fuck? It really can't be overstated just how much of a marvel there is to the water physics in Marathon 2. They're so far ahead of their time that it's, it's simply wild. Duke Nukem was being built with water areas in mind at the same time that Marathon 2 was in development, but Duke wouldn't release until January of 1996 two months after Marathon 2. Bungie incorporated an oxygen meter in this game, just like they did in the first one, but unlike that first entry, where there was really only one map where the oxygen came into play, here in Marathon 2, there are multiple areas where the security officer is required to go through underwater scenarios in the name of progression. While underwater, the player can press the run key to swim upwards to surface and save on oxygen, but they can also fight with fisticuffs underwater. While your weapons don't work underwater, except for the fusion pistol, although that will just electrify the water around you and hurt you instead, neither will enemy weapons. So if a gun-toting four dives underwater to chase you, you'll literally have the upper hand in that you can make lay them to death, and they can't even attack you. Greg Kirkpatrick, who also worked on the story, designed most of the maps for the campaign alongside Jason Jones, and they were bound and determined to chisel works of art out of the map-making process. Kirkpatrick crafted the map The Hard Stuff Rules, which somehow was able to create seven different overlapping areas on a Mac in 1995. Kirkpatrick said, quote, this level was named for the fact that it was incredibly difficult to make. My machine crashed every five minutes while making it, and I had to move each point at least 10 times to get to the underlying areas. In addition to the technological advancements made here, Bungie also aimed to create a massive expansion of the Marathon universe with a story that takes place over the course of millennia. 
detailing the evolution of the Sfit species that we met in the first game, as well as introducing new concepts about the Four race and a much deeper mythology than what was hinted at in the first game. The world building was so involved that there were concepts and backgrounds drawn up for an alien species that literally only appears during one singular frame of a cutscene in the game. Now, I don't want to turn this whole video into just a parade of me rambling about the fascinating details behind the scenes of Marathon 2's development. Instead, I'm going to point you kids in the direction of the Marathon Scrapbook, a PDF file that was originally released as a print book packaged with the Marathon Trilogy box set that was released in 1997. The scrapbook is teeming with all kinds of glorious notes and tidbits and sketches and facts about the making of these three games, including some history behind the creation of the games that Bungie developed prior to Marathon. Most of the information that I used for this video comes from this scrapbook, which was found for me by friend of the channel, Darth Agent 6 who did a lot of historical research for me for this video, and I am forever in his debt. But that being said, I will provide a link to the scrapbook in the description below, because we could get lost in all of these details behind the scenes here, but rather than get too caught up in the creation aspects, I'm going to fast forward a little bit to Marathon 2's release and shuffle in a few more details about work done during development when I talk about the individual aspects of the game moving forward. Clearly, Bungie had high expectations and a grandiose scope in mind as they put themselves to task with developing Marathon 2. They didn't want to just do a sequel to the first game. They wanted to create something that evolved beyond the experience of the first game into something that transcended what they had created before. Bungie, as they had with the previous marathon, sequestered themselves in their Chicago base of operations under the mandate that no one was allowed to leave the building until everyone had played through the game twice. The play till you puke method definitely did a couple of the devs in, you know, because crunch is bad for you kids. But at last the game went gold and on November 24th, 1995, Marathon 2 was released to the public and received thunderous accolades. Critics lavished praise on the title, with Mac User Magazine calling Marathon 2 probably the best first-person gore fest ever. The magazine would also later list the game as one of 1996's top 50 CD-ROMs. But Marathon 2's release schedule didn't end there. <laughs> Oh no! Unlike the first game, Marathon 2 was ported to Windows 95 in September of 1996, and also made an appearance on the Apple Pippin console as Super Marathon, which was a bundle package containing both the first and second Marathon games, making it Bungie's first console release. Oh, they grow up so fast. Of course, the Pippin was a complete disaster and one of the many casualties of the console war between 1995 and 2001. Well, okay, I suppose we could actually state that the console wars technically began in 1988 with the release of the Sega Mega Drive, followed by the rechristened American version of the console being released in 1989 as the Sega Genesis, but you know, for, for the purposes of this video, I specifically cite 1995 with the release of the PlayStation and the impending releases of the Sega Saturn and Nintendo 64, as well as the imploding Atari Jaguar and 3DO consoles, but I'm, I'm getting off track. Hang on a second. Funnily enough, the Super Marathon package wouldn't be the last time that Marathon 2 would see a release on a home console. In 2007, Microsoft announced that Marathon 2 would be coming to the Xbox Live Arcade with a port developed by Freeverse Software. The port was a tremendous tech upgrade with support for four player split screen multiplayer, as well as eight player Xbox Live multiplayer, 16 9 widescreen support had a revised HUD and updated textures and sprites. And considering the first marathon wasn't available to Xbox owners, the game dropped the two from the title and was rechristened Marathon Durandal. It seems like a really odd choice to port the second marathon game in a trilogy to Xbox, no matter how popular Bungie and the recently released Halo 3 were at the time. The developers of the port also were thinking about this. Over on Reddit, one of the devs under the handle Hippie Man discussed how Freeverse believed that they only had one opportunity to bring Marathon to the Xbox, and considering how small the first game was and how convoluted the third game was, Marathon 2 felt like the sweet spot of the series to deliver to new gamers. Plus, they had the code from the Windows release of Marathon 2 to work with, which was a huge plus in porting a game to a Microsoft console. In my research, it's this version of the game that people seem to remember the most. Marathon 2 was introduced to an entire new generation of gamers, riding high off the Halo trilogy and interest in seeing what games that Bungie had developed prior to the adventures of Master Chief. And considering that there is marathon iconography all over the Halo series, 
fans were no doubt invested in looking for connections between past and present franchises. The port was so popular that it received not one, but two DLC map packs in 2008. This leads us all the way up to the present day. Marathon 2's source code was eventually released to the internet by Bungie in 1999, as well as the trilogy being released as freeware in 2005. Kinda makes paying for the Xbox version a little sus. Anyways, using this open source code, an enhanced version of the Marathon engine, called Aleph 1, was developed by fans over time, and is currently the best way to play the games today. I mentioned this in my Marathon 1 video, and I'll mention here as well that I downloaded and played Marathon 2 using Aleph 1 for the low, low price of absolutely free. Go to the website, download the game, you don't even have to install anything, you can just unzip the package and voila, there you go. It's really that easy. Okay, so we've covered the history aspects of the game, how it was developed, how it was received, and how it's seen today. The biggest impact of the game arguably came with the port in 2007 as a curiosity to be discovered by Halo fans, considering that the game was originally released on Mac with a small port to Windows in 1996. Marathon, in recent years, has enjoyed a small resurgence thanks in part to the Aleph 1 port making it more accessible, and it seems like Bungie has noticed. With a brand new Marathon game on the way, now is probably the best time ever to be a Marathon fan. You can get all three games in the trilogy for free, optimized for modern computers, and as such, you'll no doubt be primed for the new game come day one. But today, we're talking about Marathon 2 still. After all, that's the title of the video. And if you read the title of the video, then you already know that Marathon 2 is a tedious, frustrating, pretentious game that is more a necessity of product than a work of passion and might possibly be the biggest disappointment I have experienced on this channel to date. I get a lot of complaints from those who believe that I shouldn't be looking at boomer shooters and criticizing their story elements, which is a ridiculous thing to say. I'm not out here asking for fucking Lord of the Rings with each of these shooters, I just want this shit to fucking make sense. Doom had a story, you kids remember Doom, right? And this story was as such, you're a marine, there are demons invading Phobos, and you need to fight your way out. It's simple, it's straightforward, and it makes sense. It makes sense in that it conveys what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what happens after. Yes, it might all be told in flavor text, but that doesn't mean it isn't telling you what's going on. This was what was necessary back in the olden days of computer gaming when there was limited space with which to convey thoughts, ideas, plot, direction, all of that. A lot of classic games have a story that is simple setup, while the game itself is the execution of the story followed by a resolution at the final screen. Super Mario Bros. tells the story of Mario, who travels through the Mushroom Kingdom on a quest to rescue Princess Toadstool, who's been captured by Bowser. You play Mario's journey, you defeat Bowser and his minions, and the story ends with Princess Toadstool's rescue. See, that, that all makes sense, right? You know what you're doing, you know why you're doing it, and you understand what happens when you finish it. I think some of you kids might be getting confused when I talk about story in boomer shooters. The word story doesn't necessarily mean the use of a cinematic narrative. It's just a communication of ideas and concepts within the structure of the game itself. Whether that story goes into minute details or complex character interactions isn't the point. A story is just a means of communicating what is happening in the world around your character. Doom tells a story and it makes sense. Marathon 2 tries to tell a story and it does not make sense. Oh, it, it pretends that it makes sense, and it pretends that the story it is telling is important to the player. But by the ending splash screen, we realize that everything that has happened has happened in a vacuum, with no meaning or impact directly onto the player, and that whatever is going on here will either make sense in a sequel, which the ending of the game implies, or it is just supposed to make sense on some deeper level, which we, the player, just don't quite grasp, which it does not. And considering that there was originally no intention to make another marathon game after this one, well, the cliffhanger is a cliffhanger for a cliffhanger's sake, and that's just bad writing. All right, hold on to your hats, kids, and I'm um, trying to make this brisk because I'm gonna be honest here. I'm having a hard time talking about the story of this game because I fucking hated it, and my brain is actively rejecting it even as I read this script out loud. First off, let's compare the tonal shift of Marathon 2 from the first game. Marathon 1 opens up like this.
Marathon 2 opens up like this. That is an immediate and jarring tonal shift that we're introduced to. Let's say that Marathon 1 didn't exist and that Marathon 2 was our first introduction to this series, as it kind of was for lots of gamers on the Xbox in 2007. Even getting rid of that expectation of similar vibes, Marathon 2's cold open is, well, shocking is probably the kindest term that I can think of right now. Uh, by the way, for the rest of the video, I'm going to try to be mostly referring to Marathon 1 and 2 as M1 and M2, just to keep things simpler on the explanation side of things, and so that I'm also not just saying the word Marathon over and over and over again. So M2 opens up with our player character, the returning security officer dubbed Mjolnir Recon Number 54, literally teleporting into the middle of a fucking firefight between some other humans and some four fighters. There's no build-up, no rhyme or reason, we're just in the fucking thick of it getting trigger happy with some bobs from the marathon in media res. For those who need a bit of a reminder, the bobs are humans who were born on board the marathon during its 300 year journey from Earth to Tau Ceti. Born on board, B-O-B, hence Bob. The bobs here are definitely beefed up from M1, now carrying magnum pistols just like we do, and on specific maps, they will teleport in and out of the arenas we find ourselves in, providing backup and shooting at enemies as best as they can. We're gonna meet up with the bobs a lot more in M2 than we did in M1, and Bungie intentionally made them stronger to service the plot. Durandal, that cheeky, snarky, borderline insane artificial intelligence who caused all of the problems in M1, returns, having kidnapped the other humans as well as the security officer before venturing away from Tau Ceti on his adventure out here into the furthest reaches of the galaxy in order to use all of us as a front-line assault group to help search for some mythical technology that can supposedly warp entire planets or at the very least, moons across the stars. Because Durandal knows that the universe will eventually die, and he wants to find a way to uh, swerve around that. So we get to run around this alien world searching for clues through ancient technology for the fate of the 11th clan of the Svit, who have been in hiding and technologically evolving for thousands of years, all while fighting off the four who have been stationed here in an attempt to stop us from doing so. Now, a brief cutscene at the end of M1 told us that after 17 years of traveling the universe, Durandal had discovered the Sfit homeworld of Lawan. Now, 17 years later, Durandal is awakening from cryostasis all of the humans he had kidnapped and is using them as an invading landing force to take Lawan by storm from the clutches of the four, with a liberal amount of orbital bombardment mixed in for good measure. <laughs> I have several questions. So at the end of M1, as Jason Jones pointed out, we saw the security officer getting teleported away after chatting with the uh, Marathon AI Leela about the current state of the ship and Durandal. Leela had just finished telling the security officer that Durandal had transferred his program onto the four ship, commandeered it, and then warped away with a wink and a grin. Then Leela gave us the lowdown on how the Battle Royale cyborgs had defended Tau Ceti, yada yada yada, and the game ends. So you're telling me that Durandal warped away and Leela gave us a speech, and then Durandal just warped back in like, JK forgot my favorite security officer, and then proceeded to kidnap us, alongside several hundred other humans from Tau Ceti just for shits and giggles, including a man named Robert Blake, the populist leader of the Tau Ceti colony, a detail that comes up later in the narrative, puts us all into cryostasis, and just warps away again, only to wake us all up at the Sfit homeworld of Luan, where we are dropped onto the planet to take it back over. Mash it? No. I really thought that I was missing something. 
I went back and read the manual after this little bit because I remembered that there was a, a prelude written in the manual of M1, which had actually helped explain a lot of the opening circumstances and gave bonus insight into what was going on. But the manual for M2 just includes a first person narrative from the perspective of the security officer that explains basically what we just came to understand. So there's no new information or hidden meanings or, or setup that we need to know. Marathon 2 just simply and plainly drops us into a combat situation on an alien planet fresh out of cryostasis with only a magnum pistol and our fists and just expects us to be fine with that. And it's not like this is something that we as FPS connoisseurs haven't experienced before, but like, come on. At least in most other shooters, we've got a second to collect our wits before we need to start pulling the trigger here. Buy me a drink first. Anyways, everything is going fine until reinforcements arrive and then... <laughs> Uh, I should probably edit that pun out. Reinforcements arrive to stop our search and also capture Durandal's memory matrix. See, one of the rogue AIs from the first game, Tycho, is somehow along for the ride and he's helping the four because he fucking hates Durandal, but Durandal would rather self-destruct than become a digital slave to Tycho. So once we've found all the info we need to locate this 11th clan, Durandal asks us to terminate him which we do, and then we're captured by the Four and Tycho, and then we're immediately liberated by the remaining humans that Durandal have been forcing to fight for him. The humans, led by the charismatic Robert Blake, understand that the Four want to make their way to Earth once they're done here on Luan. So even though they're more than a little relieved that they're no longer essentially slaves to Durandal, they have to figure out a way to contact the 11th clan in order to enlist their aid to stop the Four before they head to Earth, and basically, we need to rescue humanity. Which is a bit of a stretch, but we're, we're stranded here, you know? So why why not? Let's resurrect a long-dead alien AI to help us stave off a potential alien invasion of Earth. Along the way, we're, um, treated to snippets and sketches of what happened to the ancient Sfit on Lawan just before they were enslaved by the Four. We keep finding old Sfit terminals, which grant us a little insight into said events, but they're all so disconnected and haphazard and filled with multiple alien words that to make any sense or order of them is a bit of a fool's errand. Nonetheless, we are at least able to establish that a pair of godlike beings placed the Sfit here on Lawan. The Sfit then split into 11 clans, the 11th clan disappeared on one of the planet's moons, and it's this particular myth that Durandal has been chasing the whole time, believing the technology comes from an older-than-time alien race and is what will lead to his salvation. We reactivate the ancient Sfit AI, dubbed Toth by Durandal before his untimely demise, and Toth then helps us activate a signal relay which draws the 11th clan out of hiding and come to our aid. Durandal then returns because... I actually don't fucking know how he comes back, he just does. And once the four are on the run, Toth then turns against us because its AI programming is about balance. We were the underdogs a moment before, but now we're winning and we've got a cocky rogue AI on our side again, so Toth is like, all right, better switch sides and even up the odds for literally no reason other than Durandal predicted that this would happen. Tycho is destroyed, the remaining humans hijack a four shuttle and escape, and Durandal finds the coordinates he needs in order to track down the technology he wants, just before the four let loose a supernova warhead, which destroys Luan's son as well as Luan with it. The game ends with Durandal telling the security officer that there is still more work to be done before warping away and ending on a cliffhanger. Oh right, and the final screen tells us that Durandal eventually made his way back to Earth 10,000 years later in a strange alien craft just to ensure that humanity never forgot him. Cut print the end. This is a vapid, empty story filled with details that make no goddamn sense and have no pertinence or immediate impact on the player character, all of which serve as a supposedly deep narrative and mythology, which really amounts to little more than padding and hollow storytelling. I walked away from this game at the end with my head in my hands, halfway tearing my hair out from the game's desperate attempt to provide a profound story, and halfway aghast that this overcomplicated narrative was from the same minds who delivered the outstanding story of the first marathon. Of course, I did have to go and research the deeper details of the plot in order to attempt to ascertain the aspects of the game that I must have missed during my playthrough, because after all, the first game definitely hid a bunch of story elements in secret areas, so this game must have done the same thing. And it did. 
just in the most unsatisfying manner. Now, in a terminal message that I missed on both of my playthroughs of M2, Durandal tells us directly that it was him who contacted the four ship that attacked Tau City, and after the events of M1, the four returned to Tau City and completely destroyed the entire colony, including the Marathon itself. Durandal feels slightly responsible for this loss of life, but also says it's a good thing that it happened because it slowed down the four from just marching all the way to Earth, which by comparison, is just a backwater little planet with billions of potential slaves living on it. I mentioned that this terminal was one that I missed because all of this information here in the terminal is highly necessary to understanding the plot of Marathon 2, or at the very least, Durandal's motivations throughout the game. M1's incredibly dense plot relied on two things. One, the terminals that were easy to find during gameplay, thus filling the player in on the base narrative so that we could understand what was happening around us, and two, hidden terminals that helped to fill in the complex multi-layered backstory that gave even more context for the events of M1. Now the thing here with M2 is that during my playthrough, I felt like I was missing a lot of terminals. A lot of them. So much so that later events in the narrative, which were supposed to be revelations, fell flat because there were holes in the puzzle that the game had been building up to that point. Like, I was able to make out the image that the puzzle pieces were supposed to be making, but I was also frustrated because this hazy, half-filled-in image still didn't provide enough clarity for me to actually wrap my head around what was going on. After completing the game, I went through the various wikis and marathon websites to try and get a grasp on what I missed. And yeah, there's some real pertinent information that I was missing partially due to hidden terminals and partially due to the game's difficulty not being conducive to exploring for secrets. I didn't mind this as much in M1 because the heavy bulk of the hidden terminals were to explain the background story and make things make even more sense. Here with M2, the hidden terminals contain elements of the plot that are kind of necessary for the player to just understand what the fuck Durandal is talking about sometimes such as the fate of Leela, but without that information, certain details are too obfuscated to make sense. And with the terminal that I just pointed out, it turns out that I, I didn't actually miss that terminal. It was a terminal that I needed to return to and activate again in order to see a new message posted there. For most of the game, once you've read a terminal, that terminal's message remains the same unless the game directs you to return to it upon completing an objective. In the map I'm talking about, titled The Slings and Arrows of Outrageous Fortune, Durandal outright directs the player to find a different terminal in order to leave the map after the objective is met. There is no reason or direction for the player to return to this first terminal to check and see if there is a new message. For Bungie to place important and pertinent information into the game like this is just kind of... It's fucking mean is what it is. What we have here is a pretentious sci-fi story that seems to be under the impression that it is telling something important simply because it has decided that it's important. What details were given of the Svit origins are rendered impressively obtuse through the utilization of numerous alien words, some of which are presented to us with definitions, but many of which are never defined. So we're left with impressionistic sketches that seem to think they have depth simply because someone put in the time to create a backstory. In fact, the themes of the story that I thought we were leaning into are never touched upon by the narrative, which baffled the hell out of me. Throughout both Marathon games, the four are constantly referred to as slavers, and the Svit are oftentimes referred to as their slaves. Meanwhile, Durandal's character themes are about systems of control, how he spent 300 years as a sentient being controlled by humans which only saw him as a computer program, and also how he managed to manipulate everything and everyone around him, including the security officer, and then escape the marathon to freedom with his newfound friends, the Sfit, who have also been liberated by the end of the game. So when Marathon 2 opens, it opens with Durandal essentially now in the role of the enslaver, having kidnapped a legion of humans that he is forcing to do his bidding by invading the surface of Luan. As the game continued, I could feel a certain lack of excitement in myself as I played the game, realizing that there was no drive for me to want to push forward in this campaign. In Marathon 1, I wanted to liberate the crew of the Marathon. I wanted to push the four off of the ship. Both the player character and me as a player were invested in what was happening and had the motivation to push onwards. But here in Marathon 2, both the player character and myself are being pushed against our will 
towards objectives that we have no personal investment in. Durandal tells us directly that the humans are only helping him because he's threatened to throw them back into cryosleep if they don't. He's even forced cybernetic upgrades to their bodies to make them more efficient. To this point, Durandal himself has now become a slaver in his own right, and considering the themes of control and manipulation of the first game, I was convinced from the outset that we were going to touch on the notion that now Durandal had come full circle, from slave to enslaver, as we, the player, were being forced into combat that we didn't want to engage in. I mean, I, f I flat out did not want to play this game. I didn't understand the player's purpose of being on Lawan, other than Durandal using us for his own gain, and that didn't feel good. It didn't feel like something I wanted to do. I actually actively struggled to maintain interest in this game because I understood that the security officer had no investment in this narrative or in this war. We were literally being forced, step by step, to push forward and enact these scenarios, and as the other humans felt like revolting, so did I. This was not my war. This was not my fight, and I felt resentful that I was being told to fight it. Yet this story, as interesting as it could have been, is one of many wasted potentials that Marathon 2 simply overlooks or just does not even consider. There's a brief, weak plot point about the nature of sentience and awareness, and whether or not our understanding of those concepts is undermined by the discovery of our genetic ancestors and their own primitive sense of cognizance. Yet this too is completely brushed past fairly quickly in service of the secrets of the Sfit. Once upon a time, the Sfit race was divided up into 11 clans and were constantly in a state of civil war amongst each other. The names of these clans were, and I quote, the Svitlar, the Svit Ra, the Svit Ma, the Svit Ka, Svit Vir, Svit Ra, Svit Val, Svit Shur, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, North Dakota, Svit Nir, Svit Yor, and the Svit Kur, the lost 11th clan of the Spit. All of this is really confusing and would be even more so if it wasn't for the fact that the word Svit Kur is used multiple times to refer to the 11th clan. Despite all of the word salad, it's pretty easy to get the overall point that the game was trying to get across. The 11th clan pieced out and left Luan behind, just before the rest of the Sfit were attacked by the four thousands of years ago. Those remaining 10 clans attempted to unite in order to fight off their brutal invaders, but it wasn't enough. Loan fell, the Sfit were enslaved, and all that was left of the 11th clan were rumors that they were still out there, evolving and refining themselves into something more. Along the way, we'll find ancient Sfit terminals scattered across Luan, lost journals and notes from ancient inhabitants, writings of the four attack that led to the Sfit enslavement, scientific observations of a feral race of aliens called the Flicta, and excerpts from Sfit mythology detailing the origin of the species and their ascendance to sentience through cybernetic enhancements. It was the mythological notations that confused me the most, because the way the terminals are written, it 100% feels like biblical myth-making, talking of two godlike beings named Euro and Pythia that created the Sfit, and how one of them died, and this led to the entire race being split into the Eleven Clans. Apparently, the Eleventh Clan retreated to a sister planet or moon called Kalia, and one of the godlike beings, Euro, or Yaro, depending on the text, as the spelling kind of goes back and forth, sent Kalia to the stars, which didn't mean a single goddamn thing to me because, as I mentioned, most of this is written in the style of religious text, where it would make sense if you understood the context behind it, but without that context, it's just a jumble of words that exist for someone else's benefit. Durandal himself even seems uninterested in the goings-on of the tale. Where in the first game, he comes across as a simmering, sinister presence full of sarcasm and barely restrained insanity, the Durandal of Marathon 2 is a by-the-numbers seed of arrogance, a haughty little know-it-all whose charisma never rises above Kirkland's signature Hannibal Lecter, which would be suitable if it was any other character, but this is Durandal. This used to be a breathlessly entertaining and wild artificial intelligence who stayed one step ahead of everyone in Marathon 1. Here, he just seems to be a silhouette of that original creation, and I felt so let down by that. Which really makes me feel like Marathon 2 itself is little more than a caricature of the first game, an after image of what Bungie thought the first game was, and little more than a direct-to-video sequel which refuses to understand or touch on what made the first entry so good. 
Tycho, one of the other rampant AIs from M1, also returns. Turns out that he piggybacked onto the four computer systems when they returned to Tau Ceti, and now he's helping them fight back against Durandal's assault on Luan. After a heavy skirmish, Durandal is forced to crash land his ship on one of Luan's moons, with the four attempting to break into the ship and salvage what they can. Durandal's systems are compromised, and he asks us to terminate his logic core so that he can't be assimilated into the four network, because he doesn't, quote, want to end up like Leela, unquote. See, there was another hidden terminal that I missed that explained how Leela had been dismantled and shoved into a series of different four servers on some type of garbage scow, and that's what Durandal is referring to. Isn't this fun, kids? Isn't it fun not knowing what's actually happening around you in a game? During all of this, Tycho decides to info dump on us, connecting bits and pieces of the Ancients Fit text and translating them based on the four information that he has. Turns out that Yiro, or Yaro, is actually Yaro. And they're not a godlike being, but a highly advanced alien species that have been missing for untold millennia, and they supposedly had the ability to warp entire moons out of a solar system. This connects to the Sfit myth of the moon Kalia being sent to the stars, and Tycho gloats that Durandal has been chasing an actual literal myth as the one hope for escaping the death of the universe. Tycho thinks Durandal is a fool, and I, and I mean like, at this point, uh, can you blame him? Tycho is close to downloading and absorbing Durandal, so we destroy Durandal, which is a weird twist, I have to admit, and then we're teleported off of the ship and into four captivity. But after a few weeks of imprisonment, we're rescued by the human forces left behind after Durandal's demise, and then we're teleported out. This is actually a kind of funny little map because like the level for this one begging for mercy makes me angry has very few save stations for us to utilize so we're dropped into this level the big house and it's literally just a scripted sequence that we need to observe until all the four outside our jail cell are killed although they can turn and shoot at you in your cell if you're not careful but once it's all done we're dropped into the next level called this side towards enemy with no weapons and a single magnum to find nearby meaning that if we somehow die before finding the save station in this map we're sent all the way back to begging for mercy and then have to run a bunch of that map and then sit through the scripted sequence of the big house again and <coughs> and then try to find a save station in this side towards enemy this game's design is something else here in this map, we come in contact with Robert Blake, mentioned above, and he's leading the human resistance against the four. He's not upset that Durandal is gone, since Durandal had been cybernetically modifying the humans and forcing them to act as ground troops in his war on Luan, carelessly throwing these humans into violent combat against their will. You know, like that uh, that theme of Durandal becoming a slaver, <laughs> which is never ever explored. Blake expresses that a huge weight has been lifted from everyone's shoulders with Durandal gone, because even though they're stuck here on Luan, they can at least control their own destinies on how to proceed. However, Blake knows that the four are trying to get back on track with their invasion of Earth, thanks to one of Durandal's last messages sent to him. Blake tasks us with trying to reactivate an ancient Sfit AI called Ta which is probably the only way to contact the Svitker, which would in turn be enough to turn back the four so they don't invade Earth. Now, here's the thing. The plot line about the four potentially invading the Earth is a loose thread and a throwaway one. Remember in that one terminal how Durandal said that him calling the four to Tau Ceti got the four to focus on that particular colony instead of searching for a juicier prize like, say Earth? Well, that's been folded into the larger goings on as though it has any pertinence to the immediate plot at all. Whether or not the four have decided to invade Earth is completely irrelevant and is so lightly touched on that it almost feels like gaslighting when the game suddenly pivots to, we need to make sure that the four don't make it to Earth. Like that was never part of the equation at all here, kids. We were here for ancient fit technology. The idea of the four invading Earth was, was just that, it was just an idea. But now, like some kind of inception, it seems as though the game is pushing on us the responsibility of preventing said theoretical invasion as though that was the plan the entire time. As we run around activating all of Toth's personality cells, we get to encounter a whole bunch more of the simulacrums that appeared in the first game. Those are the androids that look like humans but are secretly bombs. They fucking suck. Meanwhile, there's another hidden terminal with a warning from Durandal that Toth, the AI, is not unlike the ancient Egyptian god, Toth, who was obsessed with balance, and so this alien artificial intelligence might also be. Durandal also tells us that he will return. I'm kind of glad that I didn't find this hidden goddamn terminal, because number one, it spoils the fact that Toth is going to turn on us, 
And number two, it spoils Durandal's eventual return. But yeah, we power up Toth. It starts computing everything going on around it, decides that it needs to help us fight the four and figure out how to contact the Svitker. And at this point, Durandal returns somehow. I really want to stress the emphasis on somehow, as there really isn't any specifics surrounding how Durandal returned. The most we get out of Durandal on the subject is that he confidently announces that, quote, Tycho was a fool, end quote. Great storytelling. Without any pomp or circumstance, Durandal announces, I'm back. He proceeds to let us know that the Svitker have heard our transmission and are joining us to fight against the four. And, uh, ah, yeah, Tycho is dead. Tycho's ship rammed itself into the moon and blew up, and Durandal wrote something in Latin on the surface of the moon using a focused laser blast as a final little fuck you towards Tycho. Blake, meanwhile, has captured a four ship and taken off headed for Earth. They left behind a cryptic message. The dead walk again, we cannot wait. Which Durandal takes as a reference to him returning from deletion, but the way the story is going, it could mean just about anything. Durandal lets them go, but reveals that he's grown fond of the security officer and wants to keep him around a little bit longer. Fucking hooray. Durandal tasks us with one final assault mission, and after we finished cleaning up some messes, we're told that the four fleet has been thoroughly routed and that they've decided to utilize an ancient Yarrow weapon, which causes a star to go supernova early, meaning it's time to get the hell off of Luan before the Nova Shockwave incinerates the planet. Durandal hints that there's still more out in the cosmos for us to investigate, and we just up and leave and head out towards some spiral arm of the universe, and that's the end of the game. We are treated to a final splash screen that deposits a hell of a lot of story bits on us that don't really add anything to what we've just experienced, nor does it really give any hints to what we should expect from a sequel. The most important bits of information we receive are that Durandal eventually returned to Earth 10,000 years later, operating a Yarrow Dreadnought, and that Robert Blake and his men successfully made it to Earth in their shuttle and were the only survivors of the Tau City Massacre. All while this fucking Marathon 2 theme is playing in the background. Nah, look, kids, I'm a fan of obtuse abstract stories that don't spoon feed the audience the themes or intricacies of the plot. I love that shit. Some of my favorite movies and games are like that. Of course, that shit has to be done in such a manner that is more intriguing than confusing, more interesting than frustrating. And unfortunately here, Marathon 2 seems to simply exist for the benefit and pleasure of the creators themselves, rather than exist as a tool for communicating anything interesting to the audience. Which is a crying fucking shame because M1 is so precise, so dense, and executed with such focus that I couldn't help but be sucked in by it from point one. M2 seems to ditch everything that made M1's plot interesting in service of strict world building and shoving the player into places that the story dictates just for the sake of of plot. None of this feels organic in the slightest. Simply a series of scenarios strung together just enough to justify some kind of narrative that never comes together, nor does it inspire a want to see more. To say that I was disappointed by this confusing, bland, pretentious tale is probably the understatement of the year. Now look, a bad story can be overcome if the gameplay is at least interesting and vicarious enough to deliver an experience that distracts the player from how banal the background escapades are. And when that happens, a game can at least become passable and fun enough to play even when the story isn't enjoyable to experience. Marathon 2's gameplay is little more than a highlight reel of everything frustrating about the first game's flaws while magnified tenfold into a tedious parade of frustrating events. It's as if Bungie learned all the wrong lessons from the first game. Rather than a series of narrow, labyrinthine corridors inside of a giant spaceship, M2's environments are larger, more open, sometimes with multiple stacked layers one or two or three levels high. With this in mind, gone is the isolation of the first game, the feeling of cat and mouse hunting. Instead, now replaced with generously oversized environments filled to the brim with bullet sponge enemies constantly seeking you out in a metric fuck ton of unnecessary backtracking. It is really, really difficult to talk about the gameplay of this game because over the course of the nine hours that I played Marathon 2, I found myself frustrated beyond belief at horrendous difficulty spikes, swaths of empty landscape that was necessary for me to trudge back and forth across, save stations spread so far apart that it felt like I was being discouraged from exploring too much, and despite the impressive technology behind it, tedious underwater segments that severely limit your ability to defend yourself. I cannot stand this gameplay. I cannot fucking stand the gameplay of this game. I have been trying for what feels like weeks now to push through this script to get to this point. And while I could talk about the story in depth for 
uh, well, however long I just did, the gameplay of this game is so rout, so boring, so tedious, so insipid, that it's practically pancreatic. M1 had a sensation of isolation to it, which when combined with the mystery of the situation, seduced me into searching through the narrow hallways, checking corners, always on edge, and wondering if I was the hunter or the hunted. M2, however, opens things up quite a bit, allowing larger spaces to be filled with dozens more enemies than we encountered last time. On one hand, you'd think that this was a good thing for a first-person shooter. You want there to be action. You want to run around and shoot things. You kind of don't really want to in this game. Marathon's mechanics service tighter, shorter bursts of action that occasionally open up into larger scuffles that are enhanced by the presence of AI helpers joining you in combat. Marathon 2 opts instead for much, much bigger groups of enemies in spaces that make it so you can unfortunately alert nearly every enemy in the surrounding area oftentimes leading to 10 or 12 enemies bearing down on your position, all of them firing projectiles, transforming Marathon 2 from a first-person shooter into a bullet hell. You would think that the wider spaces mean more room to dodge or to potentially escape, but instead it provides the enemies in this game to flank you and dump multitudes of explosive projectiles into the arena. And that wouldn't be too bad, I suppose, if all the enemies just didn't require so many goddamn bullets to take down. Depending on the weapon that you're using, you're probably going to be emptying at least half a clip into just one enemy, or you'll reload halfway through depleting their health bar, and they'll get in a couple of shots at you during that process. Yes, the reloading mechanic has returned from the first game, and along with it a sense of strategy about how or when you should empty your clip in order to force a reload. As before, there is no manual reload button here in Marathon. Instead, the security officer will only reload whatever weapon he's carrying in the moment once the weapon clicks empty. But, and this was a problem in the first game as well, oftentimes you're going to want to hold on to every last bullet that you can stock up on. Wasting four or five bullets just to force a security officer to slam a new magazine home feels sometimes like you might just be wasting four or five shots that you sincerely are going to need in a moment of panic. And that's what this reload mechanic induces. Panic. Not cool, calm strategy like the devs probably intended, but absurd, swear-laden panic as your gun empties at exactly the wrong moment. Every. Fucking. Time. Because all of your foes require so many shots to fucking kill. I'm trying desperately to approach this clinically with a professional critical eye but i'm having so much trouble doing so marathon 2 made me angry it made me not want to play the game several times over half of the goddamn enemies in this game lob some kind of explosive at you or they explode themselves when you kill them. So maybe 75% of the game is about facing down some kind of explosive damage in one way or another. You don't want the enemies to get up close to you, but you also don't want to spend too much time shooting at them. Too many bullets wasted in one situation can lead to a famine of ammo later down the line when you really need it. Considering that the workhorse of the game, the assault rifle, is woefully inaccurate from afar, you could very easily find yourself chewing through precious magazines that aren't always readily available. Of course, of course, Durandal does try to help you out with this by teleporting caches of ammunition at specific points on some maps, but this feels less like a boon to the player and more like a lazy way for the devs to justify their disastrously unbalanced mechanics. The arsenal remains basically unchanged from the original game. You've got your vastly overpowered fists once again, whose damage is based around how fast you're moving forward at any given time. You can even double punch this time around, something that I didn't know about until after I finished the game, because, uh, well, why would I try to alt fire on a fist? And I, I didn't see anything in the manual stating that I could use both fists for punching, so it felt really cheap that there wasn't really a way for me to know that I could use two fists in this game, which, believe you me, I wish I had known about this during my playthrough, because there are times when using the fists are your only options in combat. <laughs> you'll, you'll see, kids. <laughs> Oh, you'll, you'll see. The Magnum Pistol returns from the first game, and if you pick up a second one, you can dual wield them. Yeah, yeah, look, see, that there at least shows you the outline of your second pistol when you pick up a second one, visually communicating to the player that you can dual wield them. Where's that for the fists, Bungie? Come on! The assault rifle is back with a slight visual upgrade, and, as mentioned already, is still wildly inaccurate, but can and will stunlock enemies so long as you don't run out of ammo while trying to do so. And it still launches grenades for the alt-fire. Th this is nice. This is good. This is 
necessary, but I swear to God, I felt like I never had enough grenades to get me through the sections I really needed them for. The fusion pistol is back as well, although the goddamn thing doesn't appear until nearly halfway through the fucking game. For close to 45% of the game, you're rocking the magnums and the assault rifle, and that is it. However, you will come across plentiful amounts of ammunition for weapons that you have not yet acquired during the course of the campaign, so maybe somewhere in there there's some sort of secret area, you know, you can maybe find these weapons well in advance of where the campaign actually places them, maybe, I don't know, I'm not gonna spend the time to look up a walkthrough and figure it out because I fucking hate this game. The fusion pistol offers an opportunity to utilize a weakness that both the four and fit enemies have. Armored foes are less susceptible to ballistics, as are the mostly cybernetic fit and uh, whatever these rolling tank zombies are. But thankfully the fusion pistol will fucking wreck these assholes so much quicker than the magnum of rifle. Although the trade-off for the bonus damage against certain foes is that the fusion pistol fires projectiles while the magnum and rifle are hit scan weapons. So you're faced with the age old dilemma of tracking enemies and leading your shots while dodging their return fire versus expending a ridiculous amount of ammo to keep the enemies stun locked as much as possible. I was so very, very thankful for the fusion pistol in the long run, and just like in the first game, I primarily traded off between this and the assault rifle as my main weaponry to get through this experience. The next weapon on our list would have gotten more use from me. However, there is not enough fucking ammo in this game to justify it being here. Meet the shotgun, a double-barreled dealer of death that impossibly flips Terminator style to reload. The shotgun in Marathon 2 is undoubtedly what most people remember the game for. It's stylish, tears through enemies like tinfoil, and what's more, you can fucking dual wield two of them. As far as shotguns are concerned, and as a lover of shotguns in FPS games, I can tell you that this one friggin' rips. It can two-shot most high-tier enemies depending on your proximity, and can even shred through two lower-tier enemies at a time if you've got them lined up properly. But just like other weapons in this game, the shotgun has some cons to it that frankly outweigh the pros. For starters, it is way too easy to chew through all of your ammo. Way, way too easy. When I saw that the shotgun has two shells, I thought that maybe it would fire one at a time, or use the alt fire to shoot both. Nope, you shoot both shells at once, which is understandable considering other double barreled shotguns of the time. However, with the other weapons in this game, each ammo pickup represents one full magazine of ammunition when you gather it. Since the shotgun fires both shells at once, every ammo pickup represents one single round from the shotgun. So where having say 20 odd assault rifle magazines means that you have a significant amount of ammunition, 20 shells is just 20 shells. That's it. If Bungie had made the shotgun blast maybe one at a time instead of both shells, it, the doubling how much ammo you could potentially carry for this weapon, I would probably give this gun a pass. But as it stands, considering the overall low amount of shells you'll find throughout the game, utilizing the shotgun is a risk reward option that asks too much risk for too little reward. You see, the spread on this makes it so you're absolutely going to have to close in on your targets you're also going to have to aim carefully, as a missed shot with this weapon is more costly than with other weapons. So you have to put yourself directly in the line of fire, up close and personal. While you're potentially going to take down an enemy quicker than you would with any other gun, the shoddy isn't going to stun lock. So now you've opened yourself up to incoming fire. And even worse, a good number of enemies in this game explode on death. So if you're in close contact with the shotgun, chances are you're within the blast radius. Uh, at best, you're gonna be taking damage. At worst, you're dead. I had heard so many good things about this shotgun. Nothing but praise and adoration. And on one hand, Yes, absolutely, this shotgun wrecks shit like few others of the time did. Dual wielding a pair of shotties and indiscriminately destroying everything in front of you like Moses parting the Red Sea is shockingly satisfying. However, how ever, dual wielding shotguns means going through ammo twice as fast, and so this weapon and the akimbo tactic are best used sparingly and situationally, because otherwise you'll be out of ammo, or at least desperate for more. As such, I found myself shying away from using the shotgun. I didn't want to get too close to the enemies, and I didn't want to dump too much ammo since I wasn't sure where or when I'd find more, and as such, this double-barreled shotgun ended up being more of a disappointment than the power fantasy some have labeled it to be. The rocket launcher's back, which is fine, it works, it causes a big damn explosion. I don't like that it rests on the left side of the screen, because then the aim is thrown 
thrown off considerably compared to the other weapons, which are center screen. I clipped the edges of walls with rockets more times than I'd like to admit because I kept forgetting to take into account that the rockets were firing at an angle and not straight ahead like the rest of my arsenal. Uh, plus the force of the rockets firing pushes the security guards backwards a little bit, which at times pushed me backwards off of a ledge, usually into lava or something poisonous along those lines. Uh, flamethrowers here again, but most enemies are either covered in armor or are cybernetic in design, and the flames only really work best against fleshy enemies, so half the time it felt like a waste of ammo to use this. And we've also got the alien gun returning from the first game, except this one doesn't fire a horizontal spread of ballistics. This time, it launches fireballs, which are all well and good, but just like the flamethrower, this weapon is going to be most effective against organics, so when used on armored slash cybernetic beings, it just feels like I'm dumping ammo with little return. All of these weapons have significant weaknesses when compared to their relative damage output. Now, again, comparing and contrasting to M1, M2's gameplay combines wide open arenas with either inaccurate or low damage weaponry as, uh, I don't know, possibly a way to make the player feel as though they're being overwhelmed and outnumbered by their foes. Again, a stark departure from M1's narrow halls, which funnel combat experiences into a hasty, twitchy mayhem where the spread of your rifle or the projectiles of your fusion pistol could actually be beneficial. But by opening things up so much here in this game, and by adding in higher risk proximity, I spent most of my game trying desperately to either close in or stay away, always off balance, never quite sure what the right answer was, constantly getting flanked by enemies sweeping around or approaching from behind, which lend a, a laborious, tedious prospect to the combat. Marathon's mechanics do not lend themselves well to crowd control, so for Bungie to swap out the cat and mouse hunting for crowd control arenas without making any other adjustments to gameplay is fucking baffling, especially when you take the water into account. Now, by all means, again, the water physics, and yes, the water actually has physics, are to be ridiculously commended. This is a giant leap forward, technologically speaking, for first-person shooters. Uh, yes, Duke Nukem 3D was working on underwater levels at the same time as M2, but M2 got here first and also has water that fucking rises and falls. Water can rise, fall, sometimes continually unless you hit a switch, adding some fantastic brain-teasing elements to the gameplay. But once again, where Bungie pushes forward in concept, they produce tedium in execution. It is not fun to either explore or to engage in combat in the water. So to begin with, water has three levels of engagement. There's wading, partially submerged, and fully submerged. Wading is simply walking across the top of water-covered floor or platform that barely slows down the security officer at all, and you have full use of your weapons. Partially submerged sees a security officer nearly up to his neck or chest in water. You move much slower and need to hit the swim key to either rise out of the water, or you need to find some stairs leading up and out onto a higher platform. In this state, you'll be able to use most of your weapons to a certain extent, so long as they can fire over the water. Rocket launcher and assault rifle grenades are not recommended in this state, as they'll more likely hit the surface of the water directly in front of you, causing you to take the explosive damage and waste ammo. Then there's fully submerged. Underwater, you're constantly sinking to the lowest point, and you trudge along accordingly. Pressing the swim key, which by the way is the run key, doesn't make you move through the water faster, but instead causes you to simply rise up towards the surface. And while you're underwater, there are only two weapons you can use, the fists and the fusion pistol. The rest of your weaponry won't even fire. And the fusion pistol is a false idol, because even though it fires underwater, it immediately causes feedback damage on you, so there's literally no point in trying to use it. This also graces Marathon 2 with, from what I can tell, the first use of an energy weapon firing underwater to cause damage to the player. <laughs> well done, Bungie! There are so many, many situations during the course of the game where we will find ourselves dunking underwater to explore, manipulate, and puzzle solve. I mentioned earlier that the oxygen meter gets used much more often this time around than it did in the first game, and while it is absolutely necessary for these segments, you're never going to find yourself underwater long enough for oxygen loss to become an issue. The only mapper that becomes fraught even in the slightest is in the massive, experimental level titled Kill Your Television, which is about 75% water and it is a fucking slog to get through. Oh, and just like how the first game tasks you with intentionally damaging yourself by running across lava and pain liquids, 
M2 outright requires you in certain areas to literally swim through lava for extended periods in order to access specific points of some maps. This is just outright unfor fucking giveable. I refuse to give M1 a pass for forcing me to run over lava. There's no goddamn way that I am going to look the other way at being fully submerged in lava. What can make all of these even more difficult to navigate is the fact that, yes, Marathon 2's water has physics. That means that, unlike other games where all you have to do is hold the forward key to hop up and out of the water, you need to have a bit more lift in order to toss the security guard up and out and onto dry land. I could not, for the life of me, understand what I was doing wrong for most of the game. I thought that it was a crapshoot as to whether or not I could catch the lip of the platform next to the water, but as it turns out, you need to sink deeper under the water so that as you rise upwards, you have more momentum to leap out of the water and to safety. But if you don't time it right and you miss the small window of opportunity where the security officer is high enough from leaping out of the water free willy style, you'll return to near surface levels without enough momentum to hop up and out, so you need to dive back down again and build that momentum once more. This was so fucking frustrating, especially in those times where I had to get out of being submerged in lava. Constantly losing health while frantically trying to swim up and figure out how to get enough lift is anxiety inducing like nothing else I've ever played in a game up to this point. Holy shit, I was actively begging the game to please, please, Please let me out of the lava. Please let me retain just a little bit of health. Please don't let me die again because I don't want to have to backtrack another 20 fucking minutes to my last save. Ah, ah yes, kids. Yes, here we are. The bane of my existence in this game. The unforgivable venom seeping through the veins of Marathon 2. The save stations and the health stations. They are spread out so far, so far across these giant ass maps that it is an exercise in banality to travel back and forth across wide, stretched out sections of map that have been cleared out already, just to save or to regain some very, very precious health. As I have mentioned before, there are some hideous difficulty spikes in the game. Occasionally, you'll round a corner to the tune of six or more, four attackers lobbing grenades or other explosives in your direction, and you'll be forced to counterattack with your own grenades and spread out bullets. And as you're doing so, all of these explosives are bursting around you. You're practically getting carpet bombed. And in these instances, one of two things will happen. One, you'll die, and you'll be forced to reload the previous save, which is God knows how far back behind you. Or two, you'll narrowly escape with what little health you have left, and then you'll turn the corner and run into another cadre of explosive wielding foes, and then die, and then reload your save. Marathon 1 had a similar problem, and I griped about that in that video. Here, Marathon 2 doubles down on this issue in that the save stations are so spread out and sometimes placed so deep into the opening of a new map, it feels like a wild, panic-induced sprint to find a save station somewhere across these giant, wide-open areas that we're being forced to meander about. I mean, all you have to do is take the wrong turn at the outset of a map, and you're screwed. Sometimes a save station is so far back that you'll have to load into the end of one map, cross the length of a second map, and then find yourself back in the map you just died in in order to try and locate a save station once again. Marathon 1 did this too. I hated it there. I hate it even more here. What makes this even worse is that there are points where you can accidentally cut the power to a save station that you desperately need and in doing so create situations where you either need to survive by the skin of your teeth well into the next map or face the consequences of reloading the same stretch of 15 minutes of gameplay over and over and over again. The game is full of so much of this bullshit, constantly running low on health, frantically running back half a map to find a health station because there's no fucking way you're going to continue forward and risk losing 20 minutes of your precious time with no new save stations in sight. But the absolute apex of dickish, monstrous design elements that Bungie adhered together is the final map. Titled, All Roads Lead to Saul, here at the very end we have a series of bulkhead doors that we need to open by punching out a bunch of circuits. Okay, sure. There's four circuits to punch out. Two of them open the bulkhead doors. One of them causes lava to flood the area which you need to do in order to access the next part of the map, and the fourth circuit knocks out the power to the closest save station. Now, the game does not tell you that the circuit knocks out the power to the save station. I thought that I just had to punch all four circuits in order to progress. However, 
If you don't want to run a long stretch of heavy combat while surrounded by bubbling lava, lava you can and will drop into if you're not careful, including a final arena fight with a score of enemies, including multiple armored foes that explode and a giant juggernaut that fires flames at you, then you need to make sure you don't knock out that circuit. But you won't know that that circuit cuts the power to the save station unless you experiment with not punching out the circuits, and the only way to experiment with that is by running through this section multiple times. Now, the final level, just like most levels, has save stations and health stations that are spread out really, really far. So running this over and over again requires running the same tedious, stretched out combat encounters with numerous juggernauts over and over and over until you figure out which of these circuits does not cut the power to the save station. And then you finally have a save point and health at a point closer to that final arena battle. However, the game further yet commits a cardinal sin by providing you with a health station that tops you up to absolute maximum, then forcing you to swim through lava to get to the teleport pad that will take you to the arena fight, and the teleport pad drops you into fucking lava that you have to swim up out of in order to start the arena fight. You are forcefully dropped into lava before the final battle. If you are lucky, if you're really fucking lucky, you will have maybe half of your maximum health when you emerge into that battle. At worst, a third of your maximum health. Right before the final fucking battle. Mind you, this is the crown jewel of the game's fiendish trickery. Elements of this appear sporadically throughout the rest of the preceding maps, but here we are treated to Bungie's final triumphant fist pump of aggravation and assault on the player's nerves. And this is coming after the penultimate map, titled Feel the Noise. Feel the Noise tasks the player with entering into the map after a series of battles, which may or may not have left the player with dwindling health and resources, and proceeding to trudge desperately through so many fucking combat encounters before even being allowed a glimpse of a save station or a health station. I spent maybe 40 frustrating minutes trying to run through this cacophonous spiral of damnation just to be able to save on this goddamn map and continue playing the fucking game. Spread that experience out across 27 fucking maps to various degrees and yeah, I'm a little fucking tired of talking about and thinking about this fucking game. The painful little cherry on top of this shit cream is the fact that there is not one single track of music playing in the background whilst running around aimlessly throughout this whole game. Not one. I mentioned this earlier, but I have to hammer it home now that Bungie made the intentional decision to not have an original soundtrack because, quote, it wouldn't be realistic, unquote. Alex Serapian made the absurdest statement about how it's unrealistic for a malevolent artificial intelligence to be blasting rock music from the speakers of a spaceship while you're running around it, and that to me is one of the single best I don't understand media quotes I have ever read. That's like saying it's unrealistic in the Batman flicks for Hans Zimmer's score to be blasting out of the speakers of the Batmobile while Christian Bale is screaming about the Trigger Man. I mean, like, does he think that the music in movies is supposedly playing around the characters while they're fast and furiousing? No, of course not. And the choice to not have an original soundtrack in Marathon 2, especially considering just how damn good the soundtrack for Marathon 1 was, is, is just a choice. Bungie, rather than go down the path of an OST, chose to instead employ a large variety of ambient sound effects throughout the maps, including the sound of distant explosions, machinery humming, alien wildlife calling out to each other, and I will say that these sound effects are not only well-crafted, but really well-executed. The problem, though, the problem is that you're spending the majority of the game running around in mostly complete silence. And when you're sludging through underwater sequences, across wide, empty spaces, and backtracking to regain health or save your game, the tedium and the lack of interest creep in far too fucking quickly. Thank <laughs> you. 
It's been a long time since I struggled this hard with a game on this channel. System Shock is the last game that I can think of where I literally had to force myself to push through in order to see the finish line. Marathon 2, despite the caliber of the game and the franchise before it, suffers from aimless design mechanics, tedious gameplay, and pretentious writing. Marathon 1 was such a breath of fresh air, a title that I immediately restarted after the credits had rolled. With Marathon 2, I tried to do the same thing, but I quickly lost interest around the sixth map. I just couldn't be bothered to continue the game any further, even after turning the difficulty down a notch to try and allow myself some breathing room to explore some of these maps. But lowering the difficulty only served to highlight just how goddamn boring all of this is. Turning the difficulty back up reminded me of how uncommonly unforgiving Marathon 2 can be. And when a game flickers between boredom and beratement at the flip of a switch, there's definitely a problem with the game's design. The opening quote to this video came from a conversation that I was having with a friend about the intention of an artist creating a piece of work and the interpretation of said art by the public at large. I have seen some artists and some developers become livid when audiences misinterpret their creations or their intentions behind them. But the truth is that the mission of the artist is to establish a dialogue, not dictate a train of thought. While we can take into account the meaning that certain creators put into their media, and here I'll just say computer games specifically. If the gamers come out on the other side of the experience with a different interpretation in mind, then instead of getting angry at the player for, say, not getting it, maybe they should stop and take a step back and look at the delivery method behind their game and instead ask, why didn't the player understand what I was trying to say here? Try as I might, I just don't understand what Bungie was trying to do with this game. It certainly doesn't feel as planned out or executed as carefully as the first marathon, but rather embodies the corporate mandated sequel coda of bigger and bolder for the sake of being bigger and bolder. M1 was not a game without flaws, several of which prevent it from being an outright classic, but the rest of the game experience is so well done that it outweighs the flaws. Bungie had expressed their misgivings about the execution on aspects of M1, but in their quest to craft a sequel that outdoes the previous entry, they've done little more than enhance everything aggravating about about Marathon 1 and delivered an exhausting mess that can't seem to justify its own existence. And of course, no doubt the devs who worked on this game would have something to say about that takeaway, as would any creator whose work isn't well received. But in the quest to create more of the same work, sometimes that which is created enhances the original story, but a lot of times, more is just more. Marathon 2, compared to the first game, feels like The Matrix Reloaded compared to The Matrix. The first Matrix told a concise story with excellent visuals and masterful execution of both story and special effects, and it wowed the world who all wanted more. The Matrix Reloaded delivered that more, but it was a bloated, meandering, sometimes boring slog. On top of that, it was designed to be a sequel from the ground up and not a straightforward original story, and intentionally ended on a cliffhanger so that we would want to see the already planned third film in the franchise. The ending cliffhanger of Marathon 2 implies that there is more to come, even though Bungie intended this to originally be the ending of the series. There would, of course, be a sequel in the form of Marathon Infinity, developed not by Bungie, but by a studio called Double Ott, which was composed of former Bungie devs. That's something we'll eventually get into, but Marathon 2 suffers from being the middle child in a three-act play that wasn't intended to be a three-act play when the first act was created, and as such, has a lot of belief that the story it is telling is incredibly important, but all it ends up doing is stretching out into a series of disconnected events that are strung together by dry, Tolkien-esque world building that has no immediate impact on either the player or the main character. And what makes this feel even more disappointing is that, just like The Matrix Reloaded, Marathon 2 does have moments of action grandeur that do work and had me on the edge of my seat. But when those moments are sandwiched between excessive slogs, it's hard to sit back and remember that those moments actually exist in the game. Sometimes, art is made by people who are just so confident that the art they are creating is important simply because they feel like it is, and that's usually when these projects fall to pieces. I'm baffled. I'm, 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 I'm absolutely baffled. I heard nothing but great things about this game going into it, and since I loved the first entry, I thought it would at least be a decent time. But this is just so bad that I can't even bring myself to play through it a second time on easy mode. 
Marathon 2 does have some maps that contain interesting elements. The graphical upgrades from the first game are commendable, the game contains one of the first instances of underwater exploration in a first person shooter, and the water physics here are absolutely ahead of their time. But the rest of the game is submerged in dry gameplay and egotistical writing and half-baked map design. Marathon 2 is significant for the re-release on the Xbox Live, for the underwater segments, and the use of weapon feedback using the fusion pistol underwater. It's also significant as a forebear to Halo, Bungie's future franchise powerhouse, but we'll be getting into that series another time. Bland, tedious, and pretentious, Marathon 2 gets a 4 out of 10 from me, and may I never, ever have to think about this game ever the fuck again. Alright kids, thank you so much for joining me on this journey through Marathon 2, and that completes the history of first-person shooters for the year of 1995. Coming soon, we will be diving into 1996 and looking at some all-time classics like Duke Nukem 3D, Quake, Strife, Power Slave, and motherfucking Chex Quest. Kids, this has been one of the longest years for me in recent memory, and I'm real, real glad and very fortunate to have had all of you along for the ride. I'm, I'm looking forward to producing some brand new videos with a little bit of a twist next year, which I'll elaborate on another time. But for now, if you've enjoyed this or any of my other videos, please consider joining my Patreon or becoming a member of my YouTube channel. The Patreon is as low as a dollar a month, and you know what would be crazy? If somehow a thousand of my subscribers put in a dollar to my Patreon, I would be able to spend more time making these and even produce more content for you. Wouldn't that just be absolutely nuts? But for now, I'm off to go spend some holiday time with the family, plan out my first couple of videos for the new year, and maybe find some time to relax. I hope you kids have a great holiday, that you sit up straight, hug your moms, and definitely don't forget to stay hydrated. Stay safe out there. We'll see you next time.